Hey everyone, William Riley, uh, head of centralized finance partnerships, and um, very happy to bring on a, a uh, excellent uh, panel today of, of some elite actors in the li liquid staking space. So, with that, um, would would you guys uh, join me up here? Excellent, excellent. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks for coming out. Um, you know, for starters, how about we just go down the line and um, do just a, a brief intro about yourself and, and the projects you work with? Ernesto? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm Ernesto Boado. I'm co-founder of BGD Labs. Before I was CTO at AVE, and well, BGD Labs is uh, basically we are developing we are on the main, one of the main uh, development contributors uh, in the AVE protocol, so all things around AVE at the moment, yeah. Awesome. Hi, my name is Mara Schmidt. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Alluvial. We're the software development company behind the Liquid Collective Protocol, a solution that's focused on bringing enterprise-grade liquid staking to the market. Hi, uh, I'm Marin Tverdic, uh, Master of Protocol Relations, contributing to Lido DAO. Uh, Lido is Ethereum liquid staking protocol for everyone. Hi, I'm Omer Goldberg. I'm the founder and CEO of Chaos Labs. Uh, we do risk optimization, economic security, and mechanism design for DeFi protocols uh, like Aave, Uniswap, and Curve. Uh, prior to that was a tech lead at uh, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you, guys. So yeah, let's get into it. Um, you know, liquid staking, very hot topic in the market these days. And so let's start by you know, diving into, you know, what makes liquid staking such a compelling um, cornerstone in DeFi and what kind of unique advantages is it really unlocking in the market? Um, and, you know, I'd love to, to start with uh, uh, Lido and, and Alluvial's uh, perspective here. Sure. I mean, obviously it had a perfect product market fit because for native staking you need 32 ETH. So it removed that barrier where you don't need to calculate each time for 32 ETH, then 32 ETH. You can stake any amount you want, which is really good. And then ultimately, it gives you ability to do two things at the same time. Like you can stake and still not lose uh, liquidity of your ETH. So it really gained traction because of that. Also, in terms of uh, integrations, it helped to actually build on top and get cross-integrated across multiple projects, basically where we all somehow met uh, one way or another when we were trying to expand the access of the asset. Perfect. Mara? Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think of liquid staking protocols as actually two types of innovation. So the first one is uh, issuing receipt tokens. You're just creating receipts on a staked position that comes with obvious benefits when you think about just a maturing financial ecosystem and the things that we use in day-to-day -day life as titles of ownership uh, to be able to facilitate better capital efficiency and other things. And so, you know, the token part itself is really something that we view as, you know, receipt um, that becomes accessible and tradable uh, that can be leveraged in both centralized decentralized finance and so um, that is obviously a significant and important primitive I think um, as we look at the future of this innovation and the things and use cases that can come out of it. The second part is uh, the, the architecture around the protocol and so you can think of this as staking pools that have any type of configuration or selection criteria in most cases across a number of different node operators and so when you think about the evolution and the design of protocols like Ethereum that actually have been designed to support uh, anti-correlation strategies or move away from centralizing forces, I really think of this as a significant um, improvement to the security profile and accessibility that stakers have to using great solutions that have a diversified set of operators um, that they can stake their tokens through. Also, yeah. one more thing, yes, basically, please. that we forgot. Uh, you need zero technical knowledge. Right? You don't need to know how to run uh, validators, how to set up your nodes. Uh, you don't need to have hardware at home, or you don't need to rent it. You can just participate. So that's a major point there as well. Yeah, excellent point. And with that, 
um, I would love to kind of dive into the the difference in dynamics and perspectives when you know engaging the the retail market as well as the institutional market. I know you know Lido has been in the space for some time now, very DeFi focused. Alluvial is entering the space, um, catering towards institutional uh, folks, and I know Lido is, is is doing the same. So I'd love to kind of explore the the dynamics there, and then with that go into you know, what are the kind of demand perspectives that we're seeing from folks like Ave um, and the folks that you work with at, at BGD? So just kind of open it up to, uh, to that topic. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so that's actually a good, good standpoint to look at it. From individual or retail perspective, you're targeting uh, as many use cases as possible, right? And users are the ones who actually decide how exposed to Rift they want to be. It's all up to them. Uh, when you look enterprise uh, or institutional, it's completely different uh, narrative. Enterprises need to have additional business models on top of the asset. Uh, institutions need to have models how to actually uh, gain rewards and make it sustainable because end of the day, they need to occur some uh, revenue around it to be able to cover base cost, but not only that, to be able to expand the businesses and to be able to actually invest in research, for example, or growth. So th those are completely two different uh, narratives. What is a cool part about it, that with uh, LIDO protocol, uh, it somehow found fit in both. True, it started as a DeFi retail product, but over time it really evolved into institutional grade uh, protocol. Thank you. Uh, Mara? Yeah. Um, so I think liquid staking, uh, from a research perspective, uh, came to be around 2019, 2020. I think Rocket Pool was the really early starter there. I think you guys launched in December 2020, January 2021. Um, and of course, I think as most things in crypto or just in general, new evolving technologies, uh, enthusiasts were, I think, some of the first adopters. Um, and I think Lido's done an incredible job bringing on board, you know, crypto native retail participants and giving them access and opportunity to, to partake. Um, as someone who's actually been building a lot of enterprise grade products for the market for the last couple of years um, and working within Coinbase, I actually realized we were running into some issues, figuring out how to build a standardized, scalable, liquid staking product that would take into consideration the needs that we would have as a publicly listed US business <laughs> um, and the needs that our customers would have, registered institutions, hedge funds, um, structured product providers, ETPs. Um, and so the biggest barriers that we saw were the solutions that were available in the market um, were challenging for us to implement from a commercial standpoint. We found it very difficult to reconcile the permissionless architectures of a lot of these protocols with uh, the compliance department's <laughs> requirements um, that we had to observe things like sanctions compliance uh, and all that good and boring stuff. Um, and last but not least, it felt really important to have observability into counterparty risk and so understanding where node operators are based, what security posture they hold, you know, really having more visibility into how, you know, the configuration of an active set works. And so uh, coincidentally, at the time when Coinbase started thinking about this, a lot of other players in the market also started thinking about this, including companies like Kraken and Figment and a lot of other partners I was working with at the time. And we actually decided to partner to build a product that was going to be able to meet a lot of these requirements. And, you know, that's really how we came to be. I'm really excited for us to hopefully build solutions that help us expand across loads of different segments in the market. Excellent. Thank you. And then, Ernesto, over at BGD, what kind of demand signals are, are, you, are you seeing uh, in, in regards to adoption of liquid staking on platforms like Aave? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's m more... I will go more high level on that. Like so, uh, at the end of the day, like uh, a protocol like Gave, like gives kind of a bit of superpowers to tokens because it, it gives uh, immediate liquidity. Uh, when there is transitions like as important as uh, from proof of work to proof of stake on on Ethereum itself, uh, we kind of a protocol like Gave needs some kind of middleware, which will be the, the LSTs uh, and that. 
uh, basically unlocks like all this uh, potentiality, like in the in the underlying new um, consensus mechanism. So uh, I think that is just just the key, like of, of the LSTs, like that the, it becomes like the use case appear by itself because uh, your ETH like uh, is not uh, it needs to be like validating uh, at least in a big percentage. So that by itself is like what uh, creates this demand of, on the on the LSTs. Excellent, thank you. And then Omar, over at Chaos, you know, we can't forget about risk, and I know that's that's your that's your ball game. So can you dive into um, what type of like primary and, and secondary risk that you know folks should be aware of, and how you know you approach that over at Chaos? Yeah, definitely. Um, so just to add to what Ernesto said and, and what everyone else on the panel has said, the launch of the LSTs from a financial perspective, and in a second we'll talk about risk. Was, was pretty big because it, what it introduced was essentially the closest thing that we have today to risk-free rates. Now, for investors or people trying to understand what to do with their capital, since this is risk-free, this becomes now the benchmark um, to, to measure everything against. And um, I'll speak about the risks that we perceive when we go about setting risk parameters and protocols like Aave, um, but we'll also say that the market um, prices these pretty safely as you can see in the exchange rate. Now, let's break down the risks and the type of things that we look at when we decide whether or not to onboard um, an LST uh, token onto a borrow lend protocol or to any other type of DeFi instrument like perps. Um, the first and foremost, there's, there's a counterparty and regulatory risk. Um, that varies by the, the entity running the protocol, and you, know, you need to look at each case individually. Um, but in addition to that, you have kind of the, the primary and secondary risk. So the first risk here is, um, is redemption, I would say. I mean, before that, you also have smart contract risk, but um, and whether or not you can actually redeem them, but putting that aside, um, you have redemption risk. So when, many, when there is a rush um, to redeem LSTs at once, uh, the queue and the time to redemption gets longer. Now, the longer that that time is going to be, it stands to reason that the LST is going to trade at a negative premium. Now, this is uh, potentially problematic because a lot of DeFi protocols um, price LSTs, at least the widely accepted ones, and wrap safe ETH um, at a constant or close to constant exchange rate, and it can have ripple effects on the ecosystem. Um, like cascading liquidations and, and so on, depending on how you're setting those liquidation thresholds. Uh, we haven't actually seen this because since, um, I guess, LSTs have been released to the market, we're seeing the inverse. People are depositing, depositing, depositing. So we haven't seen many stress cases or have many historical uh, events for reference uh, to help and build uh, data-driven um, statistical models. So right now, like the, the approach from a risk perspective is very exploratory. Uh, we're trying to understand this instrument, uh, the risks. We want more data points on what redemptions and, and the premiums that these tokens trade at. Um, so it's very much working closely with the protocol developers and the protocols we're accepting the LSTs as liquidity in the protocol and thinking about the best ways to onboard them. Thank you. Yeah, great perspective on that. Now, you know, something I'm clearly passionate about is how, you know, Chainlink really enables, um, you know, services within the market. And, um, you know, I've been working closely with a number of liquid staking uh, providers, such as you folks. Um, you know, I would love to just kind of get your perspective of, you know, what type of impacts Chainlink services have in the market from, from, from your point of view. You know, we have data feeds, proof of reserve, CCIP. Um, so maybe current day impact and maybe um, how you see it evolving with these new products. Um, let's start with I guess that. Yeah. yeah, I think like... Uh, it's quite interesting, like a uh, case, because uh, at the very beginning, like of uh, LSTs, like so, STs, uh, when like the, the the full transition to uh, proof of stake on Ethereum didn't happen, uh, Chainlink was really, really fundamental, like for the and, and price oracles in general, like really fundamental for for the reusage of of these tokens in in, in platforms like like Aave, because there was a really big asymmetry, like on the asset, uh, so um, like. The way that, for example, like price oracles uh, update how the Chainlink technology works, like really help to uh, to protect like uh, DeFi protocols and not be submitted to, uh, for example, really aggressive market movements on on the centralized exchanges and so on. Uh, 
Uh, now we enter like in, uh, in, in a bit different stage on where everything is more symmetrical, which is uh, in general better. But uh, the new challenges are things like uh, Omer mentioned that uh, we maybe are getting a bit too overconfident about the price of, of the asset because it feels really safe. Right. Uh, and what I think is that in the future, like uh, Chainlink will, will play quite a big role on more sophisticated pricing mechanism. Amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll just go down the line. Mara, do you have any thoughts on, on this topic? Sure, yeah. I mean, we're, we're still seeing it today. Um, I think Oracle support and integrations are uh, quite fundamental in supporting, um, you know, different adoption use cases, particularly in DeFi. Um, I think for us, it's been um, really interesting to um, configure sort of our environment against the most prominent use cases that we're supporting today, which I would probably classify as enterprise slash institutional slash getting ready but not super ready to act in DeFi yet. Um, and, you know, building the railways uh, to support that and support more and more flow and, um, you know, accessibility in, in that side of the market. Excellent. Thank you. Mark? I mean, price feed wise, uh, market leader that actually kickstarted uh, the growth of STE or Repstack Teat. Uh, essentially, if you observe the timelines, uh, true adoption of uh, Repstack Teat or State Ethereum happened uh, when it got uh, accepted as a collateral on Aave because it started to be uh, much more part of much more capital efficient strategies compared to plain stake and hold. Right. And it was the beginning. From there, things started to be uh, more exploratory, but then uh, riskier, obviously, as with each layer, you add additional risk. And there's where a good and high-quality Oracle uh, is really, really, really important. But to put it out there, you obviously, with your conservative approach, I think you did well to limit the growth, because it really was true. Everyone was just staking, staking, staking. No one cared about the uh, withdrawals. So in combination, I guess we can say we are achieving a high level of market maturity. Thank you. And then Omar, from the risk perspective. Yeah. Um, first of all, second everything that was said here. Um, I think from a more technical perspective, we spend a lot of time um, with Chainlink on understanding uh, what is behind the actual prices that are reported on chain. Um, so to Ernesto's point early on, um, before the migration to proof of stake, essentially what we were seeing in, in most of the largest DeFi curve pools was a DPEG in the stake ETH price uh, in comparison to wrap stake ETH. Um, and that would be considered the secondary market price. When we work with Chainlink Oracles, we use the primary market price, which basically looks at the, um, the issued uh, staked ETH in circulation um, against uh, the used staked ETH with the rewards. And that gives what you could call like the real price. So even if there are like momentary DPEGs in secondary markets, it's not going to be um, the accelerant to cascading liquidations um, unnecessarily if we see a dip in a, a pool. So that's been really big. The other thing is proof of reserves, which is something new that, um, that we're seeing become a best practice and standard in the industry. Um, essentially what I said, looking at the, the issuance and circulating supply of, of an LST or, or staked ETH, is, is one step in getting that real price feed, but what Chainlink is also offering with proof of reserves is actually querying all the nodes um, and ensuring that the amount reported in circulating supply matches the amount that has been deposited um, into to be staked, essentially, which is another layer of security guarantees. Um, so yeah, the Chainlink has been huge in, in allowing us to be less conservative in the risk parameters across DeFi um, to allow adoption while still protecting the users. But it did oh. level the playground in terms of proof of reserve with DeFi and CeFi, because in DeFi everything is transparent and on chain. And then when in CeFi mm. you have that ability to go under collateralized and be more riskier, but now everything is more transparent. So that was really good. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. And you know, you know, uh, personally I'm very excited about uh, cross chain interoperability as well. CCIP coming to market. Um, you know, as, a, as the gold standard of security for bridging and creating unified liquidity, liquidity across chains for, for native asset minting. So um, I'm very excited to see that and, you know, um, be a part of driving that into the market. Now, um, 
you know, we, we have a, a little bit of time left and would like to kind of dive in with uh, chaos and BGD around, you know, uh, any type of happenings around creating um, a standardized framework um, and more specifically, a framework for LSTs and risk. And should, it, should there be a standard or should there be more bespoke uh, approaches and, and kind of why, why should we go down one path or another? Yeah, and maybe I can go first. I don't know if I if I agree with Omer on this or not. Uh, I think it's it's pretty difficult to say at the moment. Uh, like almost always, like uh, if uh, there should be or there will be a standard or not, because uh, to put as an example, like the way other prices like uh, certain LSTs is just different, like compared with other protocols which are like uh, kind of similar. Uh, so I, I will say that the, at this stage, it's even a, a differentiation point. Like because uh, you need uh, like a lot of analysis, you need uh, like contributors to to DAOs. Like you need a lot of work to actually uh, design the best strategy for the par particularities of your protocol. So uh, I think it's uh, ideal, yeah. Like uh, for the sake of like the the scale of LSTs, uh, when that is going to happen, uh, it's a bit difficult to predict. Like because also. LSTs, we, we tend to think that is uh, just the uh, ETH uh, LSTs, but it's not the case anymore. Like there is a pretty big um, native assets of other networks uh, which uh, have their equivalent LSTs, uh, and they are pretty different, like in, in, in substance compared with others. Like so, hopefully, yes, there will be a standard. I would like that, but uh, difficult to say when or, or how. Thank you. Omar? Yeah. Um I agree. So I'll just say this. I think that there are some things which should be standardized and should be considered a best practice, but you, it's, there's no silver bullet and you can't capture everything because ultimately the underlying protocols behave differently. Like even on the protocol, even on the panel, we have here Alluvial and, and Lido that if we were speaking about regulatory or, or counterparty concerns, they're very different because the protocol's mechanism uh, and underlying, underlying operating structure is different. So there, there's no like you know, rule of thumb that you can use for everything. On the other hand, um, there are you know, heuristics that you could use, not only for LSTs, but start to say things like, you know, we don't want more than N percent of, of any token um, being deposited directly in a protocol like Aave, um, let's say 70 percent or 60 percent, the number can fluctuate, because we want to have some upper bound to the protocol's exposure in the case that one of the risk vectors that we discussed earlier uh, goes wrong. So I think it can be delineated into things which should be standardized and best practices, but obviously there's a lot of nuance that's needed here because each uh, there's a lot of nuance to each of the protocols that are being built. Yeah. And just to hop in here too, I mean, we've, we're spending a ton of time on this topic. Um, the more time we're spending on it, the more clear it's becoming to us that we actually don't yet have a, a suite of standardized metrics, which is like phase one of even being able to compare risk across different protocols. So while I definitely agree on systemic risk, best practices, considerations around exposure, um, I think fundamentally one of the biggest risks that everyone is really trying to mitigate is you know, smart contract concern and then issues around potential slashings, right? And so one of the things that is emerging now as a comparable metric so that we can back into things like a risk adjusted reward rate equivalent would actually is gonna matter eventually are things like what is the distribution of clients? What is the distribution of geographical regions? What is the mixture of on-prem to cloud deployment so that we can effectively mitigate correlated slashing? So some of these things are, you know, I think fundamental in shaping everyone's understanding and being able to make educated decisions about how and, you know, when they want to participate. And for what it's worth, I think restaking and other innovations only make that even more important <laughs> for us to understand and make an educated choice around. Very good. Thank you for that perspective. And as we kind of close things off, um, you know, I think I'll just toss this one to Marin. But um, you know, what's next on the horizon for for liquid staking? Um, w if you're if you're going to look into the future for the next few years, wh where do you think we're heading? So I think it will start the domination against the native staking because of all that we discussed today. I think it will start to have thread tech adoption because it simplifies entrance to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. You don't need to be vastly knowledgeable. You can just interact through a more web two web and uh, traditional experiences that everyone is familiar with. Uh, I also think that a lot of cool things will happen because 
DeFi ecosystems can't depend on validator emissions. So we are seeing a huge amount of research efforts into restaking, uh, sourcing rewards for, from alternative uh, angles. And LST Phi that's being built on top of the assets will be uh, the future. We can look uh, at uh, liquid stake tokens as primitives now. Amazing. More users sound better to me too as well. So, well, um, I had a great time. Thank you for, for joining me today on this panel. And uh, yeah, um, that was the future of liquid staking.